we're doing work in the Eastern European country of Moldova. So we've deployed data systems, a simple checklist for the operating room teams to use, and low-cost oxygen monitors. And the result has been a 60% reduction in complications and deaths. We're now spreading this capability across the whole country. In Sierra Leone, we're engaged in an ongoing intergenerational study of war. And we know that war-affected youth uh, often have problems with anger. We've developed an intervention to help these kids do better in school and thrive in youth employment programs. One of the goals of a research project I've been working on is to figure out what expanding Medicaid to low-income adults actually does for their overall well-being. By providing people clean drinking water, that stops skinny worm disease within a year. We've now gone from uh, an estimated 3.5 million cases to 542 cases worldwide. In the border areas of Myanmar, we partnered with community-based health organizations to train their health workers and provide key health services like malaria treatment and prevention and uh, essential maternal health services. Where there are lots of households with guns, uh, you have lots of suicides because guns are just so lethal. And so we're really trying to change social norms uh, about guns and suicide. In South Africa, about 15% of people who are successfully treated for TB get TB again. We are following them such that we can bring their samples back to the School of Public Health and trying to understand what it is about them that puts them at risk of disease in the future. One of the areas that we worked on is identification of trans fat is an important problem in our food supply. And on the basis of largely our research, trans fat has been uh, mostly eliminated already from the United States. Our research on trans fat made the news in Iran. Our colleagues there went to the Ministry of Health, identified this as a problem, and there they made big progress. And now, welcome to Boston the birthplace of public health education, and welcome to this school's second century. I am Dean Julio Frank, and I am delighted to greet President Drew Faust, Provost Alan Garber, members of the Harvard Corporation and the Board of Overseers, my fellow deans at Harvard, members of the Chan family, our campaign co-chairs, esteemed Harvard alumni and friends, and HSPH faculty, staff, and students as well as the community of public health scholars and advocates from all over the world who are joining us online. A warm welcome to all. In 1913, the Harvard MIT School for Health Officers, as we were then known, opened its doors to just eight students. Since then, our school has grown enormously. Our students, faculty, and alumni now numbering in the thousands, have transformed the landscape of public health. They have played key roles in eradicating smallpox, thwarting the spread of AIDS, improving air and water quality, expanding healthcare access around the world, and improving hospital safety, to name but a few of our accomplishments. As we enter our second century, the news every day reminds us continually about the threats to your health, to my health, to everyone's health, whether it's the latest infectious disease pandemic, gun violence here in the US, the worldwide spread of obesity, the pernicious persistence of preventable deaths among poor children and women, or the failure of health systems to provide affordable, high quality care for all. If we are to triumph over these threats, we must work both at the level of individuals through medicine and also at the level of entire populations, as public health does. This is why I often say that in public health, society is our patient. Since its origins, public health has been a crossroads where research, education, policy, action, and ethics all converge in the pursuit of a common mission. Harvard School of Public Health is a great school within a great university. I am convinced that with the talent and commitment assembled at this school and this university, we are uniquely positioned to overcome global health threats. But there is a deeper meaning. In our turbulent world, where every day we are reminded about the conflicts that draw us apart, health remains 
as a truly universal value. It is therefore a bridge to peace and prosperity, an antidote to intolerance, a source of shared security. And knowledge, our unique and valued product, remains as the most powerful force for enlightened social transformation. This, I believe, is the common vision that brings us all together here. It was on a September day, very much like this one, when our school first opened its doors, almost exactly 101 years ago. Today marks yet another beginning. Today we symbolically inaugurate our second century. Today we are poised to invent the future. It is now my great honor to introduce the president of Harvard University, Drew Faust, to share very exciting news. Thank you. Thank you for those inspiring words. Last week, newspapers across the country carried the good news and the bad about the American diet. It's improving for most of us, but not for the poor. How do we know that? The Harvard School of Public Health. China has recently undertaken a rapid expansion of health insurance to more than half a billion people. A source of their reform blueprint, the Harvard School of Public Health. All summer long, as the Ebola virus spread through West Africa and alarmed the world, researchers at the School of Public Health joined forces with experts and clinicians from the medical school and beyond, working around the clock to shed light on the origin and transmission of the virus. Efforts that may lead to more accurate definition, detection, and more effective treatments. Public health is powerful and transformative. It drives discoveries that lead to healthier, longer, and more productive lives. The Chan family and their Morningside Foundation have long understood what public health makes possible. And thanks to their generosity, we are here today to announce a powerful, transformative gift. It is with deep gratitude and a sense of great excitement for what lies ahead that I officially announce that the Morningside Foundation has pledged $350 million to enable the Harvard School of Public Health, now the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, to embrace its second century and take on the field's most urgent and intractable challenges. Mrs. Chan, we are honored to have you here with us today, along with your sons and your extended family. And we are honored to accept this extraordinary gift, honoring your late husband, T.H. Chan. When T.H. Chan visited his son, Gerald, then a doctoral student at the School of Public Health in the 1970s, he knew that he wanted to support scientific research to alleviate human suffering. And here, Gerald discovered a community committed to that purpose. And he discovered mentors and remarkable leaders who have devoted their careers to making the lives of other people better. 
to binding knowledge and action in service to humanity. We are privileged to have one such remarkable leader as the dean of the school as it begins its second century. Dean Julio Frank often remarks that 30 years have been added to the average lifespan in the United States during the 20th century, and that 25 of those years can be attributed to advances in public health. What other area of human endeavor can claim so many consequential gains that have improved, extended, and saved lives? The promise of public health embodied in this school has been realized decade after decade in ideas and solutions of extraordinary scope and impact. We are vaccinated against preventable diseases like polio. We are less likely to die from coronary heart disease and more likely to understand the risks of tobacco use. We have better sanitation cleaner water, healthier babies, safer cars, safer food, safer workplaces. We use designated drivers. We combat and prevent HIV and AIDS. We lead longer lives and we lead better lives. This gift will inspire the next generation of public health students who will in turn be the following generations public health leaders and advocates. Undergraduates at Harvard are already energized because they understand just how many opportunities public health presents to change lives, to change the world. They have made it the most popular secondary field, which is what we call a minor at Harvard. Year after year, complementing the work of graduate students who are pushing the frontiers of knowledge and disciplines that continue to interact and intersect in new and exciting ways. Add to their numbers the scores of professionals educated on our campus who go out and practice what they've learned across the United States and around the globe. The video we watched just a few moments ago begins to paint the picture of just how global the School of Public Health is. But the communities, countries, continents where its impact is felt are too numerous to mention. On my trips to India and China and Brazil, trips in Africa and in Europe, I have seen that impact firsthand and up close. It is very powerful. There are acts of generosity that stir something fundamental within us. There are acts of generosity that raise our sights. And there are acts of generosity that send signals to the world, signals that echo long into the future. This gift sends such a signal. It tells the world that this is a public health moment. And it challenges Harvard to meet that moment by opening its doors wider reaching deeper and farther in research, taking risks in pursuit of new answers and new solutions. When future generations look back on the 21st century and marvel at the strides we made towards deepening our understanding, applying our knowledge, and taking on the greatest challenges of our time, they may ask, how did they know? Who made the case? Where did the evidence come from? And the answer, I am certain, will often be the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. have a short video that captures some of the commitments and ideals and values of the Chan family. 
The Chen family's dedication to charitable works is well known and is very deep-seated. They are therefore extremely pleased, and their trustees are extremely pleased, to be able to make a very, very substantial donation to Harvard to establish this school on a permanent basis. This school is about science, it's about policy, it's about economics, it's about organization of healthcare delivery. It's a very unique place where there is a mix of all of these fields of inquiry. I think being a teacher is a very high calling. A good teacher can be transformative in the life and career of a student. I became the teacher that changed Gerald's life. He spent uh, over five years in my, in my laboratory, so I got to really know him very well. He was an excellent student. Hopefully the mentor will be a, 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 someone who can be a model for them, perhaps in their lives. Maybe they will carry on and, and, and better other people. If you look at the history of public health, you will find that the one innovation that had the largest impact on human health, that's vaccination. So you may not know this, but vaccines are actually not big money makers. They're not like cancer drugs. They are important tools for protecting and saving lives. But as it turns out, many companies don't want to invest in vaccinology simply because the returns are just not big enough. A few years ago, I uh, discovered a way of making polysaccharide vaccines. Only Gerald was capable of really seeing the potential of this methodology. Any investment has to be balanced against a return, but in this particular case, the return is measured in human lives, not simply the return of the investment. Harvard is an amazing place. The gift will be responsibly handled and under visionary and strong leadership put to good use. In Harvard's four centuries of history, there are people and occasionally families whose imprint on the university is so profound, so transforming, that they truly change the course of Harvard's history. The family of T.H. Chan surely joins those ranks today. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Gerald Chan to speak on behalf of Mrs. T.H. Chan and the family. Gerald Chan, distinguished alumnus of the School of Public Health. We know he now he was a good student. <laughs> <laughs> is a scientist and a prescient investor in scientific research. When he received the Bay Helix Lifetime Achievement Award last January, he said, being at Harvard and being newly interested in biology in the 1970s was a blast. I love that sense of pure pleasure in learning and discovery. In that same speech, he went on to say that science is the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of truth, veritas, in every part of life, the measurable and the immeasurable, is the shared mission of Harvard University and the family of T.H. Chan. It is a pursuit that got a pretty spectacular boost today thanks to the lived values of the Chan family. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking on behalf of the Chan family, Gerald Chan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Well, I'm delighted to speak here on behalf of my mother and my brothers, and I thank you all for being present today. Your presence is a great honor to me and to all of us. Let me begin by telling you about my mother, who is seated right there. She was trained as a registered nurse in a British hospital in northern China in the 1940s. That was the era when infectious diseases were the number one cause of death in the world. 
Now, the medical training rendered my mother rather paranoid about hygiene as a means of disease prevention. <laughs> when Ronnie and I were kids, whenever Dad would take us or take the family out to a restaurant, Mother would have with her a small stainless steel container packed with ethanol-soaked cotton. <laughs> During the interval between when Dad ordered the meal and the dishes were brought to the table by the wait staff, Mother would take out her sta stainless steel container, tear off a shred of ethanol-soaked cotton, and wipe down all the bowls, <laughs> plates, and chopsticks that we were going to eat with. I remember being quite embarrassed by her practice of on-the-spot sterilization. <laughs> she finally stopped this practice sometime in the 1960s. By then, she must have felt that the threat of infectious diseases in Hong Kong had sufficiently abated. As a nurse, my mother used to give vaccinations to the neighborhood children. Cholera was still unchecked in Hong Kong in the 1950s, and government vaccination programs had not yet achieved universal coverage. The, neighbor, the neighbors would bring their children to our kitchen, and mother would boil her hypodermic needle in a stainless steel container on the kitchen stove and use it to vaccinate the kids. That was before we had um, disposable needles. So the barrel of the hypodermic needle was made of glass, and the needle was reused time after time with sterilization in boiling water in between. As you can imagine, the needle got blunted by repeated use, which meant that the injection was extraordinarily painful. <laughs> It was no wonder that many children screamed and wailed in our kitchen. <laughs> now, I offer these two vignettes of my mother's work as a nurse to remind us that it was, in fact, sanitation and hygiene on the one hand, and vaccines on the other, which gave rise to the largest increase in life expectancy in human history. Long before the advent of modern medicine in the first half of the 20th century, public health was the chief source of improvement to human health. Ironically, and in many unforeseen ways, we find ourselves today to have come full circle. I therefore heartily echo President Fao's statement that this is the public health moment. Now, I would also like to tell you about my father. He grew up during turbulent times in China. And because he never had the opportunity to have further education, he became unfailingly committed to enabling others to be educated. Growing up, I saw friends coming to my father to borrow money for their children's school fees. Going abroad for tertiary education in those days was an expensive proposition. Through the years, my father helped many young people to go abroad for their studies. His actions were powerful examples. It is therefore most fitting that a school should be part of his legacy. In 1974, my father came to visit me when I was a student here in the School of Public Health. This building was a brand new building, and I brought my father to see it. He was quite awed by Harvard and quite proud that his son should be a student here. It is a visit that I shall not forget. I counted my great privilege to have had the opportunity to study at the Harvard School of Public Health. It was here that I met my mentor, Dr. John 
little seated right there, who inspire me to turn from studying physics to studying life science. And it was also here that some of my lifelong outlooks were shaped, to wit, that even in business, return is not measured only in financial terms, but in human lives and human health. Our responsibility is not only towards the providers of financial capital, but also towards our fellow men. So in keeping with my mother's work in improving people's health and my father's commitment to supporting education, my brothers and I thought it most appropriate to celebrate that legacy by making a gift to the Harvard School of Public Health. This gift will strengthen the research and teaching mission of the school and help to ensure that able students will not be precluded from being trained here for lack of financial means. They will be the future for torchbearers of public health who will go forth from this school to improve human health throughout the world. It is for them that we celebrate this gift today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerald. Those were fantastic stories, and it's so exciting to be here on such a historic day. My name is Maggie Kurth Baker. I am a science journalist and an author, and currently a Neiman Berkman Fellow at Harvard University. I've been asked here today to talk with Dean Frank a little bit more about the meaning of this gift and the future of public health. So why don't we all welcome Dean Frank back to the stage. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start off by asking a little bit about the context of public health because the school and the university have been framing this as really a way to move from the first 100 years of public health education and into the second. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about what that means. You know, what, how has the goals and the priorities and the practice of public health changed from that first 100 years to what you're planning for the future? I would say that the, <coughs> the founding values of public health have not changed. There are some elements. Uh, public health is, uh, arises as the marriage of environmental action, mostly sanitation, along with the growth of cities in Europe, the microbiological discoveries of the 19th century, a sense of strong activism, and a deep, deeply embedded ethic of social justice. And those founding values, the convergence of science, action, and an ethical commitment to justice, I think remain, and I think shall remain, because that's the, the, the foundation of public health. But on that foundation, the picture has changed dramatically. The 100 years that have passed, 101, since this school was founded are not just any 100 years. They are the 100 years of the most profound transformation in the history of human health. Life expectancy more than doubled, and as President Faust reminded us, most of those gains were due to public health interventions. The nature of disease changed and the picture became much more complex. From a picture dominated by infectious diseases, we now have a, a combination, a multiple, multiple sources of burdens on human health. And the, the meaning, the human experience of disease was transformed from a series of acute episodes from, what one, from which one either recovers or dies mm -hmm. to a condition of living. Disease became a condition of living, very often a stigmatized condition of living, and so we live longer, but we also live in this series of conditions. So I would say that that was the first big health revolution of the 20th century, a shift, a 
doubling of life expectancy, a change in the nature with a combination of infectious diseases, but also of uh, non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> there was a second revolution, and that was the emergence of differentiated complex health systems, systems that are specialized in taking care of uh, sick people or preventing illness. Those functions for most of human history were delegated to undifferentiated institutions like the family or religious institutions. It's in the 20th century where we have this enormous set of people, uh, specialized people and institutions devoted exclusively to preventing disease and treating the, the ill. And that, those systems account for the largest, or the largest sector of the largest economy in the world, the US economy, 18%. They're 10% of the global economy, about six and a half trillion dollars. They employ literally millions of people around the world, including most of our graduates. Uh, so those are the two major, major transformations, and they have been transformations for the good. But as we enter the second century, we feel that the progress achieved by these two health revolutions of the 20th century are being threatened. And we have identified four threats. Old and new pandemics, whether it's infectious disease outbreaks, Ebola is the one in turn, but there, there, there have been others and there will be others. Or the new emerging uh, uh, pandemics of obesity, heart disease, mental illness. Second, harmful social and physical environments from air pollution to gun violence and tobacco consumption and bad nutrition. Third, poverty and humanitarian crisis emerging from uh, wars, from um, uh, man-made or natural disasters. And then fourthly, failing health systems, systems that fail to meet the expectations of people for affordable, high-quality care. And I think this new century has to figure ways to build on the revolution of the 20th century and chart the new health revolution in meeting those four challenges. And speaking about finding those ways, uh, when you and I talked earlier this week, you mentioned this kind of big idea goal list that your alumni had put together that had so many different goals on it that if you counted up what it would cost to actually fulfill all of those things, it was going to be about a billion dollars, which is a huge amount of money even in comparison to such a great gift as what you're getting today from the Chan family. And I'm curious about how you prioritize those goals. How do you take all of these things that are so incredibly important and decide what are the things that we're going to deal with now and what has to wait for the next gift? One of the fundamental insights of public health is that needs always surpass resources. Um, <laughs> This uh, gift that we are receiving today, thanks to the generosity of the Chan family, will uh, put the school on a very sound financial basis. It assures the sustainability of our school into its second century. And um, whereas we have a lot of pressing needs, we do want to d dedicate uh, the, the gift this is, uh, to, to that sustainability. This is unrestricted endowment. Yeah. It's very important to clarify that endowment means the principal will not be spent, is there in perpetuity. We will reap the benefits of the investment of that principal. And with that, we do hope to make a lot of transformative investments in the school. Gerald emphasized student aid as one of the values of his father. This is our top priority. We, the gift will enable us to broaden the diversity of our student base. Diversity is one of our most cherished values here by improving uh, financial aid, but also we hope to start a loan forgiveness program, which we haven't been able to do. We find many, many students who would like to go back and work either in poor countries or poor countries of origin or in underserved communities in the US and cannot do that because they have to stay in a city and work to pay back the loans. That's not right. We're hoping to start a an initiative on loan forgiveness that will allow the students to go back to those underserved communities here and abroad to do that. We need to take more risks, as, as President Faust said. We're the, by any objective indicator, the leading research school of public health, and we're highly dependent on research funding. But as federal funding becomes more and more constrained, it becomes also more conservative. It tends to fund normal science. We are hoping to launch a path-breaking research fund that will allow us 
for early, early development of ideas that are truly innovative, that are pathbreaking, to seed those projects, to make them mature to the point where they can seek more uh, uh, conventional sources of funding. Mm. Those are the sorts of investments that we hope to, to launch. We're in the dawn of two more revolutions, an educational revolution, where we, we need to invest in creating the pedagogy of the 21st century and the big data revolution. We need to have that capability. So investing in people, students and faculty, in ideas, path-breaking ideas, and in resources. Those will be the priorities for this gift, which will also provide the financial security that this community needs to continue to be as creative and productive as it has been over 100 years. Thank you so much. We're about out of time. So we're going to leave you with this next video that's going to talk a little bit more about the future of public health. But thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you to the Chan family, and thank you to Dr. Frank. Those were fantastic answers. Thank you. Thank you. There is the thought, you know, that medicine can solve all the human health problems. I am acutely aware of the limitations of even modern medicine. It's fantastic to be in a world that's so interconnected where, you know, information flows, where people move around and travel, but that also poses a number of threats that we need to be ready to uh, face and deal with. Health is good for a prosperous world, for a secure and safe world, and for a peaceful world. Public health has had such a dramatic impact on the lives of people around the world in the last century. Discoveries that range from the contributions the school made to interventions in managing HIV and AIDS to uh, the designated driver idea, which has had an enormous influence on the uh, level of mortality from alcohol and driving. If you don't have health, what do you have? We're attacking disease, we're improving health systems, we're reducing disparities. The the power of knowledge in order to improve health. Knowledge through research, knowledge through education. And this is what we produce every day here. I came into doing this work in healthcare and public health because I wanted to have impact. It's more meaningful than any kind of work I could be doing. The School of uh, Public Health here at Harvard has been one of the great contributors to these transformations in the health of the world. So this has been a great satisfaction to us to see what the School of Public Health has been able to do. I don't know what the 21st century or the, uh, or the second century of this Harvard School of Public Health will hold in the future, but we should be forward uh, looking. And I'm a firm believer that science is the lever. The gift now allows to renew that optimism. It launches our second century in a major way by enabling us to invest in people, ideas and resources. This gift will ensure that the Harvard School of Public Health will lead and continue to lead in areas of critical research and innovation. And that will ensure that the great discoveries are made in the future. So what will come next? We don't know, but we know that the School of Public Health will be at the forefront of helping to deal with it. I think our school has more impact on the world, brick for brick and dollar for dollar, than just about anywhere else on the globe. To honor Mr. T.A. Chen, this gift will allow Harvard to rename the School of Public Health as the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. This man who inspired his own family will now allow us to inspire generations of students who will now be able to come to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in order to make the world a better place.